So greetings, Earthlings. This is um, Spin Me Round, a roundtable talk in honor of uh, Dead or Alive's Pete Burns. <laughs> Sadly, no longer alive. The guy here, behind Zeno and Ian. Um, that's the only piece of cardboard on the stage tonight, I hope. Um, Pete died of a cardiac arrest last October. This is the first opportunity that um, Sound City has had to pay tribute to the Merseyside character and a half, um, a being who said, I don't do reality. My name is Richard Wintz, Dick Wintz. I'm uh, from Edge Hill University. And I'm joined by half a dozen characters and a half to talk about Pete, his impact on the Liverpool scene, uh, queer scene, and how that queer scene is now, and how that queer scene should be or could be. I'm going to introduce our guests. On your far left is Jane Casey, the empress of uh, Merseyside music scene. Uh, I'm sure nothing good culturally takes place in Liverpool without Jane's support. Um, Jane, you're in Pete's autobiography as a bald-headed hair salon receptionist who became the superstar of Big in Japan. Now, there's a bit of a contradiction in my mind here between a bald head and a, a hair salon. What was going on? Well, um, it was really simple. I kind of started at the salon as a Marilyn Monroe lookalike, you know, and everybody loved me. <laughs> and then every week they'd give me a new haircut. And within a day, everybody was coming in saying, I want my hair like the receptionist. So I'd sit there all day and watch people walk out with my hairstyle. So one day I just said, I'm going to get the haircut that nobody's going to follow. <laughs> And um, Pete encouraged me, of course. So, yeah. <laughs> That's the reason. All right, well, next to um, Jane coming inwards is Mandy. And Mandy is... <laughs> oh! <laughs> Mandy is a very close friend of Roger Hill of BBC Radio Merseyside. So much... Uh, uh, they're almost inseparable. Um, now, uh, it's, um, the, it's 300 years of uh, um, Roger Hill's uh, radio show on Radio Merseyside. Uh, or was it 30 years? One of the two. And um, I wonder, Mandy, what would Roger Hill have to say about how he's, he's celebrating his uh, triumph at Radio Merseyside? Well, he says it's 40. 40 years, oh, sorry. So maybe he knows more than you do, Dick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he would do, wouldn't he? If he got 40 and you got 30, he'd know about it. Um, I think he's very pleased, I would say. I think he's so delighted that he would wish to have been here. But I shall report all back to him in due course. Thank you. Well, uh, I hope you don't report my terrible mistake about uh, how long he's been going on. Uh, Darling, size program. doesn't matter. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> and next to Mandy, between me and Mandy, is Lady Sian, the doyen of Liverpool drag queens. Uh, she runs a night with the fabulous title of Psychic Bingo. Uh, what on earth is Psychic Bingo, Lady Sian? Well, hi everybody. It was something I invented myself. I mean, I, I seen Johnny Bongo and all his bongos, and I thought, well, do you know what? I don't need anything. I don't need any computers. I don't need any balls. And I certainly don't need anything. So I thought, all I do need is a bingo pe piece of paper and a pen. And we'll have a game of bingo. I don't get in touch with dead people. I get in touch with dead bingo callers. And it's as simple as that. They send me the numbers and we play for a line. And then sometimes we play for two lines. It depends how many people I've got in and then I'll play for a full house. And it's a surprise. And I mean, it's been wonderful for me because I never went to school. 
um, back in the day. So anyway, some people come up to me and they think I'm a mathematical genius. But you can't go wrong because you're not playing bingo from zero to 90. So you only need five numbers to win a line. Brilliant. And uh, going down the line here, that line on the, the, my immediate right, is Zena from uh, Queen Z and the Sustones. <laughs> We've just done a brilliant set. Um, how far did it go according to plan? Um, the less it goes to plan is the plan. There is no plan. <laughs> there never will be a plan. But it was good. It's good. It was good to be here. It's a good crowd. When are we going to see you next? Where can we go? Um, we play across the road at Drop the Dumbles on the 3rd of June. And are you doing something in London? Yeah, we play in London tomorrow for a festival called Bentfest, which is a drag and LGBT punk festival. And it's a combination of the two, which don't rarely or do rarely meet. So, yeah. Good. Well, next to you is uh, Ian Usher from... Uh, <laughs> From Sonic Youther, uh, though Sonic Youther was on last night, and I don't know, Ian, how you managed to uh, keep awake uh, uh, right now, but I can guess. I've lost my voice. Um, yeah, I'm feeling pretty <laughs> shit, but I'm here. Shouting at the DJ, sort of thing. Yes. Shout, shouting at uh, the... Singing to George Michael. Can you explain for some neophytes here uh, what Sonic Youther is and how it got its name. Sonic Hoover is the anti-gay club. Um, it's something that we wanted, uh, we thought was missing in Liverpool, not just Liverpool, but everywhere. Um, it's, it's for people who are a little bit older, who don't really go out anymore, who want to go out once a month um, and get shit-faced and dance from everything, from the Smiths to Mel and Kim to Azealia Banks. I don't know, it's just fucked up. And Pete Burns. And Pete Burns, obviously. First time I came in, you were playing Spin Me Round. A so, classic, uh, which we, we resisted playing for about a year and a half because we thought it was too too obvious. And then it just made sense to play it. All right. Uh, and finally, uh, next to you is Dr. Monica Pearl, uh, who is uh, from Manchester <laughs> University and uh, <laughs> is waiting for that. <laughs> Uh, of the um, Sexuality Summer School, which has been running this week. What were the themes and what was the well, talking? Well, this, this week at the Sexuality Summer School, we were trying to figure out what normality was and whether we needed to know about it or to participate in it. And we discovered that, yes, a little bit, we all do norms, but we can do queerness if we know what the norms are. Yes. Good. Well, we'll explore that in a short while. Um, windy up here. Uh, but um, I'm going to start by talking about Pete and uh, his period of growing up in uh, Port Sunlight. He was born in 1959 in Port Sunlight. He, um, his dad was a senior manager at Levers. Um, and uh, his mum was German, and the family were known locally as the Nazis. Um, he uh, had a rather comfortable but uh, fairly friendless childhood, according to his autobiography. And his elder brother Tony was uh, in the folk music scene. And uh, so Pete met people like Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel and uh, Mary of Peter, Paul and Mary, who were sleeping on their couch. Um, but uh, he then, he discovered Liverpool. He went across the water, and as a teenager, he never looked back. And um, I wonder uh, what it was like in those days. Jane, what can you remember of Pete, the young, the young Pete Burns? A young Fox Pete Burns. Him? Well, when I first met him, he was kind of, you know, kind of dressed quite normal. He was, he, I think he'd he simulated his way through school. You know, he'd kind of fitted in. Um, 
and he was desperate to come and work at the hairdressing shop that I worked in. So he used to come and hang around. He was 15. And um, we gave him a try for a Saturday job, and he really wanted it. But he was so vile to the head stylist, like, so vile. <laughs> at the end of the day, he was like, he's never coming back in this shop again. And I remember sitting with Pete on the Monday and saying, honey, you didn't get the job. And he's like, why? And I said, well, when you called the head stylist a fucking dickhead, it might have been the kind of, you know. So, he, but he was dead brave and he kept on coming back to the shop and he'd hang around the reception with me. And then we started going out a little bit at night. And then we got to understand his humor. And his humor was so vile. Even at 15, it was so vile. That, you know, if you didn't under, understand it, you would just had to be offended by it. So that was Pete when he was 15, 16, 17. Anyone? Pardon, darling? Do you have any memories of Pete? Use your microphone. I was trying to prompt you to see if you had any memories of Pete. Oh, God, well, yeah, but later, much later. All I will say in my credit is he was never rude to me. Never once was he rude to me. In fact, the side I got from him was a person who was very serious, very interested in the whole scene and in the music. Kind of really wanted to do everything very well. I think that was my memory of him. It was somebody who always wanted to get it right and get it good and to play his part in the big picture. I don't think at that stage he was a particularly um, prominent person. I mean, he grew into, a, you know, he grew into a different person. That's a bit of a cruel introduction to Pete that I've just given. <laughs> You know, he was, he grew into a really serious artist and he kind of had the best record collection. He was into every type of different music and he was really, had a kitsch take on things. So, you know, he grew into this um, amazing character and it, it kind of was happening in front of your eyes. Well, he, I mean, he grew up uh, with the, his mother, his grandfather was... Uh, uh, on the board of directors of the Babelsberg Film Studio in Berlin. Oh, okay. they, they were sort of, you know, his granddad was family friends with Marlene Dietrich, wow. who grew, you know, who developed there. I've got a great um, story about the first time I met his mum, actually, because I didn't know really that much about his family and I've never read the book, but I did once go to his house and he lived in Port Sunlight in one of those beautiful arts and crafts houses. And um, Dad opened the door, and Mum was standing at the, stop of, at the top of a lovely winding staircase. And he just, he was really fast and strong, Pete, and within a second, he'd just run to the top of the staircase, turned his mother upside down, was hanging her <laughs> into the hallway, shouting, Jane, is my mum, meet my mum. And that's how I meet met his mother. <laughs> Um, uh, Ian, you you have uh, uh, your memories of uh, Pete that are quite different different kind of style to uh, to these. Um, yeah, I'm, I I met Pete when I was ten. Um, I was quite obsessed. Um, I had some friends, local punks, that played me. Uh, that's the way I like it. And I became completely like obsessed with them. And they told me that he worked in a record shop in town. Um, and they took me on the bus to Probe Records to, to, to see him, but he'd left by then because it was just starting to happen for him musically. Um, but I met all the, the crew of Probe Records and they said, he does come back every now and again, so if you just keep coming back, he'll be around. So I religiously went, I got the bus every Saturday, the age of 10, and I'd turn up every week at Probe Records and I'd say, is Pete Burns here? And then one day he was there. Um, and I met him, um, him, his wife Lynn, and Steve, the drummer. Um, yeah, they were lovely to me. Um, I told them, yeah, you know, my brothers thought they were queers, and I, I didn't really understand what queers were, but I remember them saying to me, like, they, they said to me, have you got brothers? I said, yeah, they think you're queers. And I remember Pete just like pissing himself, laughing. Um, but yeah, they were really lovely to me. I was 10. <laughs> wow. 
And that, it didn't stop at the age of 10. I mean, it went on. Yeah, I kept in touch. I, um, Pete didn't visit Liverpool that, mu that much when he left, but Lynn came up quite a lot, so I would hang out with Lynn, and she would give me gifts every time, big bumper packages of, like, Japanese imports and signed autographs, and then we kept in touch on and off for years and years, and then when I moved down to London, I kind of... I met them as an adult and became friends, almost. I wouldn't yeah. say friends, I was... I hung out with them a couple of times and had very interesting, bizarre experiences with them. He says that, um, he says, I was a poof in the 1970s. I was called a poof in the 1970s, a gender bender in the 1980s. But I like the word queer. Yeah, I don't know. Pete, Pete just never liked to do, he never liked to pull a tag on anything. Um, he hated being put in a box. And there's a really famous um, footage of him on YouTube from when he played Gay Pride in the 90s. And he stopped the track and he said to the crowd, I want you all to shout, faggot, queer, nigger, pachy. And he just went on and like the crowd was so like proper, like didn't, and he was like, come on, I want you to shout it. Shout queer, nigger. And it, like, he just didn't, he just didn't agree with the, with being put in a box and having a label. Monica, what, Monica, what does queer mean now, generally, and what is it? What did it perhaps mean in the eighties? Is it different? Is it a well, different queer word? developed in the eighties um, because of the AIDS crisis, and the AIDS crisis changed how we thought about identity, because it was no longer about what you were; it was about what you did, right? So you didn't have to be gay to be a man who had sex with men. Um, that made you queer because you were doing it anyway, regardless of who you were or what you thought your label was. Um, and queer in some ways still is that. Um, it's more of an umbrella term and it's very um, permissive, I guess. And um, uh, Zena, what is, what's the word you use now? For myself. For yourself. I use queer and then I also use transgender. Um, I think there's been a change in, in my generation from transsexual to transgender as people have started to see it less as a sex thing and more as a gender identity kind of thing. Um, also within my generation, and I'm kind of at the, the young end of the millennial generation, it's, it's infinitely more, there's a lot more emphasis on being inoffensive and political correctness. and. Um, the, the queer scene at the moment has really blown up. There's been bands that have really publicized it. So um, terms like non-binary have started to flow around and gender queer, which were popular, but are now much more mainstream, I think, from, from that scene. But I, I personally use transgender. Thanks. And um, Lady Cian, in the 70s and 80s, uh, and also Mandy, I think, um, uh, what was the queer scene like in Liverpool. He well, talks about the Bears Paw. The Bears well, we had the Bears Paw, Harry's Bar, but I'm actually 52 years of age now. And it was 1981, thank you. I was in a squat and I met Pete Burns on Prinny Avenue in this party. And he said to me, you're a lovely little pretty thing, aren't you? And I was so starstruck. I mean, he wasn't really that famous then, but he had a beautiful little sapphire piercing in his nose. And to me, he looked like the Liverpool music scene came from punk. And then we had Larks in the Park with Keith Higgins. We had Bow Wow Wow on. And then the fashion stores had turned from punk to tribal. And where I came from, I actually got beaten up and skittered. People used to say, call me Pete Burns and punch me. People would call me Boy George and hit me. And I'd go, no, I'm not Boy George, I'm not Pete Burns, I'm Lady Cian. Get over yourselves. I really did, but they really helped the change and the movement at the time. Back in the day, the only gay people you ever seen on television were all like typecasted people. John Inman, Kenneth Williams, you know, all that lot, oh, shut that door. You know, and these young men, who really fought to be who they really were, came out, you know, you didn't know what they were. They were just 
gorgeous and they really helped the cause for gay and lesbian and trans people in our world today. God knows where we'd be without them. And for me, the whole gay scene in the world is changing every single day. There's more people now who know what their sexuality was. I'm 52, I knew I was gay when I was born. And when I was growing up, I used to say to my mummy and daddy, I should be a girl. And they dismissed it because they were so homophobic because of two cathedrals in Liverpool. We were so homophobic, it was unbelievable. And when the AIDS epidemic came out, it was even worse. All the gay businesses had to shut their doors down because we got treated like lepers. And these pop stars who betrayed and they were like guardians and living angels to believe in ourselves. And what Pete Burns did, he crossed the gender. He really did. He made young trans people believe in themselves and who they were going to be. And he was just an amazing man. And believe you me, I believe deep in Pete's soul, he really transmitted the energy of the psychic of like a tribal warrior woman like a goddess of a woman. And Pete Burns was a phenomenal, he really, really was. And Liverpool back then was so hard and so homophobic. You'd see him on a Saturday afternoon. It was like he had rollerblades on, big black hair, one big eye patch, and he'd float down London Road, down friggin' Bell Street, and people would be like, oh my God, what is that? And then, a couple of years later, you'd see Jane Casey and Holly Johnson, and they would always wear black and red. It was like, wow, they were just like phenomenal to me. And I just loved them so much because they've helped me and people like me to believe in ourselves and the crossover for certain people. I mean, I grew up where it was so homophobic and the likes of Boy George made people cross their minds. Scallies wanted to shag them. Do you know what I mean? So I did well on the back of Boy George. I know I really, really did. And Pete Burns too. I mean, to me, Pete Burns was more, more like a beautiful goddess. You know, the ultimate in femininity. And he changed himself because he believed in himself. And, you know, the Liverpool gay scene now is owned by straight people, but it is a business. And the gay pound, if you go back years ago, gay people didn't have children. So we'd spend more behind the bar. So you'd make a fortune if you owned a gay bar. So this is why the straight people own gay bars. But the empathy is not there anymore because it's not gay owned. And the word queer to me means absolutely wonderful and strange. Fantastic. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I don't, uh, Mandy, yes, your please. experience of, uh, of the change of Liverpool on the queer scene, can you talk about that? I had a conversation, no, oh, maybe about a decade ago actually, with somebody who, like me, didn't actually come from the city. And we looked at each other and we said, Liverpool is a sexy city. And that, that means it's sexier than a lot of other cities. It doesn't mean, I think there's something about a city that's sexy anyway. But I think Liverpool's sexier than most. And what is it? Well, it's a little bit rough. It's a little bit opportunistic. It's a little bit live in the moment. It's a little bit gorgeous. Um, it's got a kind of, it's, it, it's, it's got a good kind of um, um, facial features about it. It, it, it. And when you've got a sexy city, Everybody can be sexy in one way or another. The little old lady on Breck Road can be sexy. The, you know, the, 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 the guy who comes to mend your plumbing can be sexy. You know, if you've got an eye for sexy, and sexy is what the city does, that's what it is. Now, against that background, Pete was just an articulation of what it was that the city was anyway, to the nth degree. And I think we were looking for that time, not necessarily for a, a, a queer icon, what we're looking for is people that say, actually, this is what it is. This is how you do it, big style, for real, and it matters. And I think that actually one of the things about Pete's model to us all was that, uh, I'm going to disagree with her for a minute, but it's, it's only just, I'm not sure about the feminine thing. 
I actually sometimes just looked at Pete and saw that wonderful balance between male and female that gives you the opportunity to be and do anything. And it, because he could be and do anything, he did anything. And there was only a later time, which I know you're going to come to in a minute, Dick, but I think it was a bit later time, when the anything, anything shrank a bit and there was less that it was able to do. Jane, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. One of my worries about doing today was I, I wouldn't be able to classify Pete and his sexuality or his gender because he never did. So, you know, he was married. He, when I met him, you know, when I was with him as a young girl, he met his wife. And for us as, you know, a group of people, Lynn is definitely Pete's wife. You know, Lynn is Pete's wife and she was everything to him and he was everything to her. So I could never classify Pete as male or female. And I think that's the beautiful thing be about him is he gave you the opportunity to live in the middle. That's what was great about him. And I think that, I often wonder, like, you know, I, I've known Cianne since she was young and um, I was speaking to one of her contemporaries recently who's been in between for all of her life and she's 50 now and she's thinking of getting the change. And it really shocked me because I thought, okay, I thought that you were kind of just living in that in-between space because that's what it was. It was, I don't know if it'll happen again in the future. I think people can make decisions easier and earlier now, but it was a generation that couldn't make the decision to have a sex change or couldn't, you know, it kind of wasn't there on the table, so they lived in this amazing in-between place. And the only thing about the dimensionality of it all, which is that you're halfway between two extremes, is the new development is gender fluid, which is that actually you can move from side to side as and when in moments and at different times it is most appropriate. So we've moved on. It was what you were saying about the, the, the queer scene moving on all the time. That's the latest one and there will be more developments as time goes on. Would, uh, Zena, would you like, is anything there you'd like to comment on or would you pass it on to uh, Monica who will... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, no? well, times have changed to some extent because we have access to different ways of being and different identities and that we still can get beat up for being queer. That hasn't changed. Um, and so it's a real spectrum. I mean, there are places in the world where uh, men and women are still being killed for being gay. Um, and that's also true here. So we do have some icons to thank for um, being path setters for what we can do now. And Pete Burns was one of those. He really um, you know, was brave and, and lived a life that meant that we have different kinds of choices. So there are performers, and I was an activist myself, an AIDS activist in New York, so that we all have our ways of, of breaking paths. Well, Pete said uh, about the sort of uh, the way he got hassled, that I got hassled. What that taught me about the real freaks, the ones doing the shouting and giving the hassle, was it's never about me, it's about them. Whatever I'm wearing, it's not me they're seeing, it's them. It's almost like a primal jealousy. The louder they shout, the more they want the world to look at them. They're saying, look at me, I'm here too. I dress to build walls and fend off attention to keep me as isolated as I was in Port Sunlight as a child. Well, I think that's a, a very moving statement from, uh, from Pete Burns. Anybody want to say anything before we close down about Pete? No? We're all happy. Right. Well, look, thank you very much for attending. Um, and uh, if we had a record player, we'd be playing Spin Me Round right now. Thank you very much. <laughs>